Hi, Mike here. This episode is the story of six people. Six people who survived the CTV building collapse, but died in the rubble before they could be rescued. What happened to those people is really important. A lot of the scrutiny around CTV comes from this story. We can't tell you everything about it. Some of it is too graphic and can't be published. What follows, though, is the story of the effort to save those people, how they rang for help, how people tried to pinpoint where they were, and how those people tunnelled in vain to try to rescue them. There's a little strong language in this episode, and I know I've said this before, but please do take note this time, some parts of this story might be hard to listen to. Isra, she's a very good girl, and she's a quiet person. She's a lovely girl. Jeezy, he's a friendly boy. He's a good boy. This is Davinia Leach. She's Filipina, but she lives in Christchurch with her Kiwi husband, Tony. Ezra is Ezra Medallier. She's Davinia's second cousin, 24 years old. Jesse is Jesse Radobli, Ezra's boyfriend. Jesse and Ezra came to New Zealand to learn English. They were both nurses. They planned to stay and get jobs here. They arrived in Christchurch on February the 20th, 2011. They were staying at a hostel, but Davinia and Tony were their de facto hosts. That day, a Sunday, they all had lunch. Tony and Jesse watched some rugby, and they talked about taking day trips to places like Kaikoura or Akaroa once Ezra and Jesse were settled in. Both of them excited here in Christchurch and met some friends in school. And Ezra, she texted me. She said, Ati. Ezra was Davinia's cousin, but she called Davinia auntie. Ati. I'm happy we are here in Christchurch. I said, oh, that's good. The next time Davinia heard from Ezra or Jesse was the following day, Tuesday the 22nd, just before one o'clock. She got a text from Jesse. Ati, earthquake. And I said, where are you inside in school? How about Ezra beside with me? And the door is like black, collapse. And I said, oh my God. At this point, minutes after the quake, the phone networks around Christchurch were overloaded. It was nearly impossible to get a call through. Davinia had trouble contacting Jesse and Ezra texts were better than calls. Both of them, like, need help, need help. But Jesse managed to get a call through to Davinia. He handed the phone to Ezra. And that's the one she said, Ati, help me. She cried. That's my last, her voice. Jesse and Ezra were in a classroom in the King's Education Language School on the fourth floor of the CTV building when the quake hit. Several of their classmates were nearby. Jesse, he told me, he said, Ati, I'm nearly low battery. And after that, he tried to use different cell phone number that's from Ria and call me. Ria is Rika Huga, 30 years old, from Japan. She was also a nurse. Unlike Jessie, Rika had plenty of battery on her phone and she let everybody around her use it to call whoever they wanted. Later, when police identified her phone number, they used it to work out exactly who had survived the collapse and was calling for help. There was one more phone that proved to be a crucial link. It belonged to someone you've already heard about, someone who was in the same classroom as Jessie, Ezra and Rika. Someone who was able to let the outside world know what was happening in the rubble. So the entire story we're about to tell you could be pieced together after the fact. That person was Tamara Svetanova. Okay, I don't know your name. Could you tell me your name, please? Alec. Alec. And Alec, your wife is trapped in there. Yes. Tamara Svetanova was a paediatrician from Serbia studying English. That's her husband, Alec, you just heard, talking to a reporter at the site. Alec arrived at CTV about 6pm and stayed there for almost 24 hours. In that time, he clambered on the rubble over and over again, shouting and banging, trying to find his wife. 
She's, I talked to her about 12.30 and uh, she was still alive. I don't know now. You managed Hopefully. To, you managed to talk to her on a mobile phone? Yes. He met Paul Berry, the CTV security guard whose sister, Marion Hilberts, was in the building. Paul spoke to the media too. I was a bit flat earlier on until this gentleman advised me that he'd been on the phone to his wife. There are five people alive. So. And he was about to meet Senior Constable Stuart Martindale, who'd been tapped on the shoulder, handed a piece of paper with Tamara Svetinova's number on it, and told it belonged to a woman trapped in the rubble. I recall someone bringing her husband to me. This is Martindale. And I didn't see him come through, but I was on the phone and someone tapped me and said, oh, this is the woman you're speaking to, this is her husband. It was pretty damn stressful talking to this woman on the phone and then, hello, add some more stress, give me her husband, you know, standing right next to me as well. No one gave me any Stuart Martindale had been ringing Tamara's number almost non-stop since someone gave it to him. In the first hour, he called it more than 30 times. If you were in Christchurch that day, you probably remember, calls kept dropping out or just not connecting. Later, when police looked at Tamara Svetnova and Rika Huger's phone logs, they found nearly 250 instances of people trying to call or text into or out of the rubble. Most of the calls don't connect. They last two or three seconds and then drop. I remember getting a, a level of frustration because I wasn't getting through. It seemed like to last forever, but it could have been just a matter of minutes, you know. Finally, Martindale got through and talked to Tamara. Hi, I'm a cop. What's your name? She said, Tamara. Are you with anyone? Are you by yourself? I'm by myself, but I can hear there's a group calling for help. They need to be rescued. They need to be helped. And I said, OK, we're trying to help everyone. This call happened at about 10.30 at night, about the time Kento Okuda, who you heard about in the last episode, was being found by rescuers with his legs squashed into a one-centimetre gap. That was over on the west side of the rubble. Tamara Svetnova and the others near her were somewhere on the east side, the side where things were much worse, the side covered in big slabs of concrete. Rescuers there had struggled all afternoon to locate survivors because they couldn't get into the rubble. Now, close to midnight, they had some. Tamara Svetnova and five other people, alive and pretty close together. But there was one more problem. We just didn't know where she was. I'm Margaret Gordon. And I'm Michael Wright. On February the 22nd, 2011, a devastating earthquake shook the city of Christchurch, killing 185 people. Two-thirds of those people were in one building, a building that should never have been built. From Stuff, this is Collapse. I was pretty sure that we found someone. There were still people alive in there. But there was nothing being done. You know, this is a grown man in tears because they couldn't rescue these people. February 1931. The destruction of Napier by earthquake. We've mentioned before that for a long time New Zealand was a bit blasé about earthquakes. For a country that sits on two tectonic plates that owes its existence to those plates, you think we'd be a bit more worried about them. But catastrophic earthquakes belonged in history books. The last really big one was, as you just heard, in Napier in 1931, somewhere where a major quake wasn't entirely unexpected. Quick geography lesson for our international listeners. New Zealand is a long, thin country, slightly bigger than the UK. It has two main islands, imaginatively named the North Island and the South Island. It sits on the border of two continental plates, the Australian plate and the Pacific plate. The border of those plates runs pretty much the length of the South Island. That's the major fault line we've mentioned before, the Alpine Fault, and that's where our beautiful mountains are. In the North Island, the plate boundary swerves out to the east and heads offshore. 
out into the Pacific Ocean. Napier, on the east coast of the North Island, is close to that boundary, another place where big earthquakes and tsunamis can strike. That 1931 quake was one of them. 256 people were killed. At the time, it was New Zealand's deadliest disaster. The Shaky Isles have lived up to their name since then, and there have been other deadly quakes, but for a long time there was nothing remotely on the same scale. And it showed in our preparedness. In fact, after the Napier quake hit, prisoners from the local jail were released on parole to help with rescues. Things have moved on since then, but it's taken a long time. There was an earthquake in Northridge, and Civil Defence sponsored a couple of fire service people to go over and have a look. This is Bryce Connie Beer. When he retired a couple of years ago, he'd been a firefighter for nearly 50 years. That Northridge earthquake he's talking about was in California in 1994. The Kiwi observers who went over noticed something they had never seen before. All the rescue work was being done by Urban Search and Rescue. And they said, well, who are they? Urban Search and Rescue, or USA, is a kind of composite group Firefighters, engineers, medics, dog teams. Specially trained in finding and rescuing people from collapsed buildings, among other things. Very important if you live somewhere prone to earthquakes. In New Zealand, no one has the responsibility, the capability or the equipment to deal with building collapse. So we really need to start thinking about it. That's exactly what Connie Beer and his colleagues did. They talked to the government and set up a training base at Palmerston North near the bottom of the North Island. The first team was based there. Later, more teams were added out of Auckland in the north of the North Island and Christchurch in the middle of the South Island. USAR was kind of an elite unit. It wasn't for everyone. To be a good USAR person, you've actually got to have a bit of mongrel in you because sissies, they can't cut the mustard. And this created some problems. Some American experts who came over to help the Kiwi set up said, don't worry about rank. USA is about knowledge, capability and attitude. But the fire service is all about rank. That's how the system works. So USA, this elite unit operating outside of rank, that caused some resentment. And that affected USA's response when the earthquake struck Christchurch. Here's a senior fire service manager being asked about it in an inquiry in 2012. Are you telling the court that historically there has been tension between mainstream fire service on one hand and USAR on the other hand? Yes, that'll be correct. The fire service not recognising the value of USAR? Certainly New Zealand USAR does not have the same level of support when compared to some of our colleagues overseas. On February 22nd, 2011, USAR's 60-strong central team was on a training exercise at Palmerston North. Connie Beer was the team leader. It was a full-on day. We had people doing rescue operations from props we'd built in the tower. We had dogs and slings going across high lines. Amongst it all, one of the blokes from the fire station came running out and said to me, there's just been an earthquake in Christchurch. He said, it's a big one. And then my phone went and it was Paul Burns. Paul Burns was Connie Beer's counterpart in Christchurch, the USAR Southern Team Leader. I realised that this was something substantial and that we needed to get things moving as fast as we could. That's Burns. He wasn't in the city when the quake hit, but he knew things were bad. The central and northern USAR teams were heading to Christchurch as quickly as possible. The northern team in Auckland was furthest away, so the plan was it would fly out of the Air Force base at Whenuapai, pick up the central team from Palmerston North en route and carry on to Christchurch. USAR protocol stipulated that team members had two hours to report to base after being notified and another two hours to deploy. So the northern team should have been on the move somewhere between 5 and 6 p.m. The plan changed fairly early on when the Fire Service National Operations Manager, a guy called Jim Stewart Black, decided to send the central team's equipment, about 16 tonnes of gear, by road to Christchurch. That meant all its resources, its entire cash, concrete chainsaws, gas cutting equipment, listening devices, search cameras and a whole lot more, was loaded onto a truck, driven to Wellington at the bottom of the North Island, put on the Cook Strait ferry for the South Island and then driven half the length of the South Island to Christchurch. That's about a 12-hour journey all up. 
a flight from Auckland to Christchurch via Palmerston North would take maybe an hour and a half. You heard Jim Stewart Black talking earlier about USAR Fire Service tension at an inquiry. Here he is explaining this decision. I was concerned about solely relying on air assets. I did not want to have all eggs in one basket, and transporting the team and assets by various methods reduced the risk of the teams being separated from the gear for extended periods of time. So, Central Team's gear was loaded onto a truck and dispatched south. It didn't arrive in Christchurch until about 6am on February the 23rd, nearly a full day after the earthquake. In the meantime, everything else, all the personnel and the rest of the gear, was travelling by air. This did not go to plan either. And I rang up the task force leader of the Northern team. Paul Burns again. And I simply said, where are you? We need you now. I might have not used those words. I might have been a bit more dramatic in my speaking. The Northern team spent almost four hours at Whenuapai Air Force Base in West Auckland before they left. Exactly why this happened isn't clear and would become the focus of some pretty intense scrutiny afterwards. Everyone agrees the flight took off two and a half hours later than planned, but there's a whole lot of he said, she said about whether the aircraft was the right size and how the equipment was loaded onto it. Even now, it's frustratingly contradictory. The plane finally left Auckland about 8.30pm. By this time, Paul Burns, the USAR Southern team leader, was tearing his hair out. There were hundreds of buildings to attend to, and his team wasn't equipped to do it. Its base was a mess, Roads in and out were blocked, and maybe half of its 60-strong squad was able to deploy. USAR teams were designed to respond to disaster zones, not be in the middle of them. Burns had also seen what was left of the CTV building. I think the fact of seeing the CTV site just hit home. I can remember walking around and thought, is this a movie? Are we in a movie here? It's just that bad. And that was why Burns was calling his counterpart in Auckland. We need you here now. From a rescue point of view, especially firefighters, we're not the best waiters in the world. And he had a team of 50 or 60 people waiting to get into it. Standby and wait is not the easiest thing for some of those rescuers. And remember that while all this was going on in Christchurch in Auckland, Bryce Conybeare's central team, without its equipment, was at Ohakia Air Force Base near Palmerston North, waiting. It was the longest, longest, longest wait you could imagine because I'm getting reports from all over the place by then to say that there's a team from Australia on the way. They were in the air while we were still sitting at Ohakia. What are you thinking then? We were thinking they were going to get there before us. As the day was moving on, I was keeping on getting calls from Paul Burns saying... Where are you? We need you. You know, we're we're in the shit. In the end, the blushes were mostly spared. The first Australian USAR team from New South Wales arrived in Christchurch about the same time as the North Islanders, somewhere around midnight. The first of them got to the CTV site between 2 and 3 a.m., 14 hours after the earthquake and four hours after Tamara Svetnova first spoke to her husband from underneath the rubble. Jim Stewart Black later conceded that this hold-up was a major setback to the rescue. And the delays in deploying the Auckland team almost certainly impacted our response activities in Christchurch. Essential personnel and equipment sat out of reach at a time of critical need. We'll come back to USA and Tamara Svetnova and the rescue effort soon. You might remember that around this time, midnight or so, was when we left Kento Okuda in our last episode. Kento was a Japanese-English language student trapped on the west side of the CTV rubble with his leg pinned under a beam. Rescuers had tunnelled in and pulled out many of his classmates, dead and alive, from the rubble. Kento was the only one left. And when I got up close to him, I could see, he doesn't look too bad. That's firefighter Paul Rodwell, who we heard last episode. Rodwell had been at the coalface for most of the rescues in this tunnel. He reached Kento last and found the 19-year-old student's leg in a terrible state, squashed down to one centimetre thick. His leg's not going to come with him. He was very, very calm. And of course, I'm saying, do you want some painkillers? We thought we can give him some injection. We know how to do that. Um, No. By this point, Rodwell had been in the tunnel for about nine hours and he needed a break. 
He'd lost four kilos through sweat and because his helmet wouldn't fit in the tunnel, his bald head was cut to pieces. Kento's rescue would be someone else's job. The firefighter in charge of it all was senior station officer Dave Berry. He crawled in to see Kento himself. Um, I went down and saw him and gave him some oxygen because of the smoke and everything. So he sort of handed the oxygen back to me, wanting me to have some. No, don't worry about it, mate, because I know it's coming. But, um, Everyone agreed. Kento's right leg needed to be amputated below the knee. This was a much more complicated exercise than rescuing any of the other students who'd been trapped in this void. For a start, the tunnel was too small. If someone was going to perform surgery in the rubble, they needed better access. Here's Dave Berry again. So we measured it from where he was, where we thought he was, and then um, on the top, and then we cut a hole and went down. And it worked out pretty good. The hole was right on top. So now there were two tunnels leading to Kento. One vertical, one horizontal. The big question was, who was going to go in and cut off Kento's leg? And I had a doctor to one side and a nurse who was accompanying her. This is Mike Smith. He used to be an intensive care paramedic with St John, but that night he was also a USAR medic. Barry asked him to oversee the operation. The doctor Smith is talking about had been at a triage centre in nearby Latimer Square until she was called over to CTV. I'm very nervous. She was out of her environment completely and she'd been elected to go do this by somebody and showed up on our patch. <laughs> she was a bit nervous and we tied a rope around her and said, if there's an aftershock, we'll pull you out. We went down and she went down and there was an aftershock and we pulled her out, just about threw her out. And then she went back down and carried on. So there was a doctor, a nurse, two paramedics waiting in the tunnel with a stretcher, Smith overseeing the operation and Barry overseeing everything. The doctor used a reciprocating saw to cut Kento's leg. Reciprocating saws are machine powered, the blade retracts and extends. They're usually used by builders, but fire trucks carry them as well, mostly for cutting into vehicles at accident scenes. Rescuers had been using this one at CTV that night. So before the amputation, one of the firefighters went to the truck and got a fresh blade. My name's Anna Sullivan. I was involved in getting Kento Okuda out of the CTV building. I was um, the person that went in and amputated his leg in order to get him out. Anna Sullivan was only in Christchurch by chance on February 22nd. She worked in the emergency department at Wellington Hospital, still does, and she was in Christchurch to help teach a course. When the quake hit, the locals on the course went straight to the hospital to go to work. That left about a dozen out-of-town doctors at a loose end. So they went to Latimer Square, where everyone was congregating, and set up a triage centre. Anna and her colleagues were still there that night, treating the injured, when some rescuers from the CTV site showed up, looking for a doctor. There's this guy trapped. They can't get him out. Could I go and amputate his leg to get him out? And I understand that the main reason that they approached me about it was because they'd been asked to send somebody little because of the tunnel. Anna was an emergency medicine specialist, but she'd never done anything like this before. She'd assisted on some surgeries as a young doctor, but that was it. I'm thinking, OK, how do you do this? A couple of people had attended courses on wilderness medicine where one of the concepts is that uh, if you're in this position of needing to do a field amputation, it's probably easiest to go through the joint. There's less tissue and resistance involved. A paramedic who was on the course volunteered to go with Anna. They drew up some drugs, ketamine and morphine, before they left. When we got to the CTV, the fire service handed me a power saw. That's the reciprocating saw we mentioned earlier. They sterilised the blade. It was a new blade. They sterilised the blade. Uh, and they said, you might want this. And so I said, thank you very much. Do you mind if I just try it out? 
How was the saw? Have you, have you ever used it? I don't do a lot saw? of power tools. I don't do a lot of power tools. I live in a fairly maintenance free apartment. But you know, these things are relatively simple. Kento had already been given a sedative, so all Anna had to worry about was cutting off his leg. So I could see his face, um, so I could, you know, talk to him. Did you talk to him? I just said, I'm very sorry we have to do this, mate, something like that. As soon as Kento lost consciousness, Anna got to work. She was prone, Kento was lying on his back. She reached over his left leg and cut off the right one, through the knee joint. There were plenty of things to worry about. Like, I didn't want to get halfway through and get stuck, you know, because the anaesthetic would only last so long. I had not done this procedure before. It's a life-altering event to take someone's leg off. It is standard medical practice to get consent for what you do. The language just wasn't there, you know, so there were a lot of reasons to be quite nervous about this. I went down the tunnel with my power saw, and when I was happy that Kento was unaware, then I went ahead and did that amputation through the joint, through his knee joint. It went quite smoothly. The people standing at the second tunnel pulled Kento out. They dressed the wound, they tightened the tourniquet. We transferred him to an ambulance and we went to the ED. Oh, you went with him? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, So, you know, when we arrived at the ED, he was just starting to come round from the drugs. He could tell me his name and his age and he went straight into one of their recess rooms and that was kind of the end. Anna's never spoken to Kento since then. She only learned his name was Kento because he told her when he woke up. The next morning, she and the other doctors from the course were flown home. She was back in Wellington before lunchtime, back to a normal life in a normal city. The next day, we had a moment of being overwhelmed because we were flown back to Wellington straight away. So here we are walking around Wellington where nothing's happened, feeling like, did that really happen? It took me quite a while to tell other people, you know, about it. Yeah. What would you say to Kinto? I'd just Sorry. say, you know, how's it going? <laughs> you know, are you okay? You know, I'm, I remain sorry that this was what was needed, that uh, you were in this position where the leg couldn't be saved, you know? Yeah. How are you doing? Yukio Minami, who we met last episode, is good friends with Kento. They were buddies from Toyama before they came to New Zealand and they were trapped beside one another for hours. Yukio told me Kento's doing well, still lives in Toyama, works in an office. Getting on with life. Uh, me and Kento was a good friend, so sometimes I call him. He's in Toyama and last year, I think last year he got married. Mm, he's doing all right. Anna almost wasn't in this podcast. It took us a while to find her, mostly because we didn't know her name. You heard Dave Berry and Mike Smith talking earlier about the doctor as she. They didn't know who Anna was. No one did. She just showed up, had a rope tied around her waist, crawled into a collapsed building, cut off a guy's leg with a reciprocating saw, and then left. Since then, she's barely talked to the media. Once I had figured out her name, though, I did find one brief reference online in a list of Christchurch City Council Earthquake Awards. Anna Sullivan provided medical attention to the injured. There was a lot of things like that where you'd think, what the f***? From Stuff, a new 12-part documentary podcast. He was into sex every day. The Commune. Sex, drugs, and a guru called Bert. There are crimes... But this isn't a who done it, it's a why done it. Good God, adults agreed to this. The Commune. Find it now on your favourite podcast platform or at stuff.co.nz slash the commune. You've already been welcome to Centre Point. If I go here, will I be in your shot? Am I right? I just want to do one thing. You're rolling, Phil Phil. Can you hear me, mate? It's coming up to midnight, and in the dark behind me here is or was. Sorry, matey. 
That's broadcaster John Campbell on the east side of the CTV building almost 12 hours after the quake. There's no one else in shot, just some diggers in the background. A language school. Take two, Jenny. And the extraordinary thing is that there are still people alive in there. They are talking and texting from their phones. And you can see this extraordinary operation as the earth-moving equipment is desperately trying to lift... By now, rescuers were the only ones on site, apart from Alex Svetnov. Other people with loved ones in the building were further back. Davinia Leach and her husband Tony were at home. Davinia had been trying to call her cousin, Ezra Medellier. Ezra and her boyfriend, Jesse Redobli, were alive and trapped in the rubble. 30 minutes, I heard the two of them, the boys. This is Davinia talking about a call with Jesse about half an hour after the earthquake. While they were talking, another call came through on Jesse's phone. And he said, Ati, I got received call from my mom. I said, yeah, go for it. And after that, no. Nah. Signal is gone. Davinia badly wanted to go into the city, to the CTV site, but Tony didn't. The roads would be blocked and there was nothing they could do. While the leeches stayed home, Alex Svetnov did what he could at the CTV site. Late in the evening, he met senior constable Stuart Martindale. Martindale was talking to Alex's wife, Tamara, on the phone. Tamara was trapped in the rubble. It was a, a voice of panic that I heard initially, the first answer. And then when I was speaking to her, she was almost calming down. She was becoming more confident, probably herself, that she may be rescued. Alec and Tamara had lived together in New Zealand for 11 years. Both of their children were born in Christchurch. So unlike the Toyama students, Tamara was very familiar with New Zealand. While she was trapped, she called the emergency number 111 several times. Those conversations were recorded and played at an inquiry after her death. We can't play Tamara's voice for you. The tapes were suppressed by the coroner. I was in the court that day and I remember this moment vividly. The thing about it that stuck with me is how unharrowing it sounds. I was expecting to hear a frantic woman, desperate and pleading for someone to save her, but just like Stuart Martindale said, Tamara sounds lucid and calm. Also, the audio quality is eerily good. There's no background noise or anything. It just sounds like two people on the phone. Except, of course, for the details. Tamara says she's missing four fingers on her left hand, that she's with a group of people and they can't move. The dispatcher asks over and again, about where exactly they are in the building, but they don't get much further than the fourth floor, King's Education. Then the call's cut out. It was up to the people at the site to find them. Not a survival nutter at all. It's just part of the makeup that I have. This is Luke Pickering. He's an engineer who lives in Christchurch. He's not, as he says, a survival nutter or anything. But he also isn't quite your average civilian either. Luke has long hair and a ZZ Top beard. He carries a brick cell phone the size of a brick that predates text messaging, and he's almost impossible to find online. When he talks about time, he uses the 24-hour clock for accuracy. And late on the evening of February the 22nd, 2011, around 2300 hours, Luke found himself at the CTV building. I've always had lots of things to do with what I'd call fundamental survival. Uh, I tend to have things that could be used in a disaster of most conceivable types. After the quake, Luke went home and packed his truck with some equipment he thought might be useful. Hammers, spades, crowbars, a hydraulic ram. He headed into town, reported to Civil Defence Headquarters and asked if there was anything he could do to help. One of the other things he had with him was a listening device. What it was intended for was for locating pipes and in particular leaks in pipes underground. So it's essentially a very sensitive microphone. Luke was sent to the CTV site. He told rescuers there what he had, a listening device that could help pinpoint where any survivors were in the rubble. This was exactly what Alex Svetnov wanted to hear. He'd been talking to her on a 
on a telephone and we'd been with him a couple of times. He was obviously in a really distraught state. That was surreal also. Somebody could be standing just a few metres from their loved one and not actually be able to do anything about it. Luke and the others didn't know it yet, but there were at least six people alive in that part of the rubble. There was Tamara, and there were Filipino students Ezra Medaglie and Jesse Redobli, who you heard about earlier. There was Japanese nurse Rika Huger. We know she was very close to Ezra and Jesse in the rubble because Jesse borrowed her phone to call for help. And there were two others, 25-year-old Ria Sumalpong and 26-year-old Emmabel Anova. Like Ezra and Jesse, they were both nurses from the Philippines. Luke devised a system. He would work his way down the east side of the rubble, where that least knew Tamara was trapped, tapping and listening as he went. He was nervous. The rescuers had pretty much shut down the site so he could do this. And bear in mind, this is not something I'd ever practised. It's not the right time and place to conduct an experiment. But I, I guess I was reasonably convinced that it would work. What I was doing, I was sort of selecting what I'd call logical bits of debris to tap on and then see if we could get a response. Luke started at the north end of the site and worked south. Those logical bits of debris he was looking for were mostly big pieces, solid hunks of concrete that could transmit sound waves deep into the rubble. Every few metres, he found a likely piece and... That sort of thing. So it's like you're knocking at somebody's door. The system, such as it was, was knock, listen for 10 seconds, knock, listen for 10 more seconds. If Luke didn't hear anything, he moved on. And if you're wondering how agonising a 10-second wait can be... It's quite a long time, isn't it? It is. But like we said, Luke was moving as quickly as he could. He didn't want to hold up the rescue effort any longer than he had to. It took him about 10 minutes to move down the length of the site, tapping and listening. It wasn't going well. Tried a number of places. I, I couldn't tell you now. There would have been 8 or 10 or 12 sites that we tried. And they were unsuccessful? You didn't hear anyone? No. Not in the northern part, not in the central part. But then um, we got up to the south and I got a response. I just didn't quite believe what I was hearing to start with. It was just, oh, am I really hearing that? Luke kept checking, kept getting the response. Then... I heard a shout, uh, and it was a woman's voice. I thought, who said that? And I remember standing up, sort of looking around, and the only female person was a female firefighter. And I said to her, I said, did you say anything? And she said, no. I feel that that was someone below. This was not the beginning of a miraculous rescue effort. Two things prevented this. First, Luke couldn't say exactly how far away this voice came from, although he was pretty certain it wouldn't have travelled any more than five metres through the rubble. The bigger problem, though, was the rubble itself. Remember, this was the east side of the building, where big concrete beams and floor slabs had sandwiched together and thwarted the rescuers. Five metres was half a world away. I don't know, and it's one of the frustrating things, but I, I feel um, personally involved because I, I guess I feel I might have been the last person to ever communicate with some of these people. Luke, of course, told rescuers what he'd heard, but as we said, it wasn't like they could all just swing into action. Part of that was because you couldn't. The debris involved was pretty heavy. And the second one was, and again, I must reiterate that this is not any sort of criticism. It's just that the digger guys were wanting to slide debris off rather than lift it up. So you've got something that's collapsed a little bit like a deck of cards. You've got to start with the one on top. Because if you pull the card that's part way down and all the other ones then collapse on top of that. This is the delayering that we talked about in episode one. 
To this day, Alex Fetnov is adamant the delayering that happened after Luke heard what he heard was too rough. He says it caused the rubble to lurch violently, potentially crushing the people underneath. It's sometimes easy to forget. Alex Svetnov was there the entire time rescuers were trying to find his wife. He even got up on the rubble, just like Luke did, while he was on the phone to Tamara. Stuart Martindale was trying to look after him. He was a man on a mission, and he'd climb up and he'd call, I think she's here, I think she's here, and he'd call out to her and throw some rubble away, and i sort of go up and, you know, sort of help him. So we, we sort of formed a bit of a... A bit of a bond at that stage, you know, and he, he just, he, he clung to my hip. How are you feeling at this moment? Mm, I can't explain you. I, how, how, how confident are you that she'll come out alive? No, I'm praying for her. This must be a terrible time for you. Yeah. So she's been in there for about 14, 15 hours. Yeah. yeah. Have you tried calling her again on her phone? Yeah, but uh, she's turned it off to save the battery, perhaps. And that's sort of when it started getting a bit ugly for me because another time um, I got through to her and I was speaking to her and she goes, I want to speak to Alec, I want to speak to Alec. And I said to him, I said, tell her stay on the phone for as long as she can. If we keep talking to her, there's more chance that we're going to find her. He started sort of going quiet. Uh, what I mean is he, just, he wasn't as panicked and he gave me back the phone and he said, oh, she's going to turn the phone off. She wants to save the battery. Tamara's rationale here was understandable. Once my phone battery goes, I can't contact anyone, so I'd better preserve it. But Martindale was deeply uneasy. When he heard what Alec was saying, he grabbed the phone. And I said, no, 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 no. And I said, don't turn it off, and it was off. I tried to call her back and just went straight to, I can't remember this answer machine or what it was, but she wasn't answering. And that's when I had that real horrible gut feeling that this is not cool. This is, I need to talk to her, you know. That was the last time anyone outside the rubble ever spoke to Tamara Svetnova. After this, one more major rescue effort was made to save Tamara Svetnova and the others. It was done by the USAR Central team, the one based in Palmerston North. Remember, they'd arrived in Christchurch around midnight, and of all the teams that had flown in, they were the ones deployed to CTV. One of those people was USAR technician Chris Kennedy. Here he is at an inquiry in 2012, reading from his statement and recounting what happened next. We were initially looking for possible void areas where people could have survived. I remember I had a big piece of concrete. I picked up and remember giving three whacks into this piece of concrete. We waited and it was silent. And then Ian Penn picked up a piece and he had a go and made three whacks and then we waited. We heard banging in reply. Someone had answered. You know when something happens and you're beside someone and you look at them with disbelief. When I looked at Ian Penn, there was disbelief in his face and I said to him, I heard that and he said same. So we did it again, and then we waited. There was another tap. Kennedy and his colleague didn't have many tools. Their equipment was on a truck being driven down from the North Island. But they began to dig a hole with what they had. We started breaking in a hole. We had made the decision as to where to cut the hole from where we had heard the knocking. I don't remember at what stage the smoke started to waft out through the hole we had cut, but I do know at the start it was only sometimes. We managed to get down through several floors before it became more of a consistent flow. At some point in the early hours, maybe even daybreak, it was very heavy and thick and respirators had to be used. We got pulled out of the hole at some stage in the morning because the conditions had become so unbearable. We could barely work with respirators on and we have good respirators. Even though Kennedy and the others were forced out by the smoke, the rescuers didn't give up. They used machinery and diggers to pull out what debris they could. Several bodies were found as they did this. Finally, about lunchtime on the 23rd, they stood down. The squad leader, who had led the rescue effort mounted by Kennedy and the others, went back to the USAR base at Latimer Square and saw Paul Burns. 
It's still in my brain now. I can see the look in his face at midday when he came back. You know, this is a grown man in tears because they couldn't rescue these people. And, uh, you know, it was, it, I'm, I'm getting upset talking about it now because I can see the look in his face. So it was, you know, people don't see that part of it. The bodies of Tamara Svetnova, Jesse Radobli, Ezra Medallier, Rika Huger, and Emma Bellanova were all recovered from the rubble in the days after the earthquake. No trace of Ria Smalpong was ever found. Those who were recovered were often found some distance apart, despite being trapped near to one another. The diggers had to move some parts of the rubble a long way as they sifted through it, so bodies moved too. Jesse and Ezra were found on the opposite side of the building, still together. Then when we saw it on TV, we just thought, it's been too long. The fire, the smoke. This is Tony Leach. You heard his wife Davinia earlier. The Leaches were Jesse and Ezra's family in New Zealand. Davinia spoke to both of them soon after the quake, and Tony had been trying to get in touch as well. They'd considered heading into town to the site of the CTV building. Jesse and Ezra's parents had both been calling them from overseas in despair, urging Tony and Davinia to do something. They decided against it. There was nothing they could do to help. Davinia kept trying to call Jesse and Ezra in vain throughout the night. That was the last time you tried. I'll try, I'll try and try. And I said, oh no, I think everyone's gone. Davinia and Tony only really saw Jesse and Ezra the day they arrived in New Zealand, the Sunday, two days before the quake. I can see them in the lounge. Yeah. And you and Ezra out in the kitchen making the coffee, eh, huh? Mm. We're just having lunch, the four of us. That's the last. And we talked about, you know, on my days off, because I get four days off a week, we can do day trips to Kaikoura, Akaroa, just show them around, you know, and that we're looking forward to it. Yeah. It would have been totally yeah. different. The last anyone heard from Jesse Radobli and Ezra Medaglia was a text message about two hours after the quake. Madras Street, King's Education. We need help. Please. This is Ezra and Jesse. Stuart Martindale had been relieved in the early hours of the morning on February 23rd, long before the rescue effort finished. He didn't want to leave CTV, didn't want to leave Alec behind while Tamara was still trapped, but he had no choice. Someone had come up to me and said, it's time for you to stand down, time for you to go. And I said, no, I'm in the middle of, you know, we're, we're getting close, we're getting close. So I'm saying to Alec, that's right, we're going to find her, mate, trust me, we're going to do everything we can to find her. And... It was almost like I was dragged away. I thought, oh, we're going to find her, you know. I honestly thought we were going to find her. Martindale walked home alone in the dark. The next day, he pleaded to be assigned back to the CTV building. And they said, no, I want you to do something else. So, and that sort of broke my heart. You know, from that day onwards, I asked constantly about, you know, Alec, how's Alec? Where's Alec? I'd heard that they had found her body. I think I was pretty honoured and pretty privileged to be part of those final discussions with her and I can remember her calmness towards the end. Um, just thinking that she's such a, a thoughtful person to say, there's, there's people here, I can hear them crying and calling for help, you need to help them, you need to rescue them, you need to help them, you know. And all that absolute horrible stuff that was happening, and she still had the strength to say that. It was huge, yeah. No one knows exactly how many people survived the initial collapse of the CTV building. We know that more than 30 people were rescued alive, 
and that six others had survived for more than 12 hours in the rubble. More than a year after the quake, a police officer examining phone records found two more survivors. The phones of Chiang Lai from China and Louise Amantillo from the Philippines were both used for up to three hours after the quake. Louise Amantillo was actually the first to sound the alarm. Starting four minutes after the earthquake, she made 10 phone calls and sent 32 text messages. Her first message said, Ma, I got buried. Then, 40 minutes later, Ma, I can't move my right hand. She last made contact just before 4pm. At 1.33pm, Chang Lai rang her father in Guangzhou, China. Daddy, she told him, I won't make it. Of these eight collapse victims, only three were ever ascribed causes of death. Tamara Svetnova and Louise Amantilo died of massive crush injuries. Emma Balanova from the effects of fire. The reason this was known, the reason Louise Amantilo and Chang Lai were even identified as surviving the collapse, was because once the rubble of the CTV building had been cleared, attention turned from what happened to why. Then said to him, I said, you need to go away now and you need to write it up on a piece of paper what's actually happened. Because I have no doubt in time we'll be asked a lot of questions over this. Why hadn't Tamara Svetinova and the others been rescued? Should they have been? The group had been in pretty regular contact with the outside for at least 12 hours after the collapse. No other cluster of survivors had so clearly and extensively made themselves known. Back in episode one, we talked about how Christchurch had been devastated by the earthquake. Building facades crumbled and hundreds of offices in the CBD were damaged beyond repair. But only one building in the city had completely collapsed. The CTV building. Why was that? Like, we take an engineer with us to... So if we want to make access to a building or something, he can give us a bit of an idea, you know, of the structural integrity of it. This is a USAR rescuer from Queensland in Australia. He's part of one of the teams that arrived about the same time as the North Island squads. USAR teams include structural engineers, and here he's talking about the one who worked in the Queensland team. But the whole time we were pulling off pieces of concrete and big slabs and sections, he was getting them put aside Uh, for forensic examination later on. So he could see all of the structural components that had failed and, you know, caused the building to collapse like that when a lot of them around were still standing. The saga of the CTV building was just getting started. Next time on Collapse... Christchurch City Council was issuing permits that were not earthquake safe. He was on a mission. Don't get him a bloody way. Where is this building? How come it is only dust and rubble and nothing? Collapse is a stuff podcast written, produced and presented by Margaret Gordon and me, Michael Wright. Additional reporting, research and creative input by Mark Greenhill, script editing by Adam Dudding, music by Henry Nickel, sound mix and design by Chris Sinclair. If you want to know more, head to stuff.co.nz slash collapse, where you'll find links to every episode, as well as photos, graphics and feature articles. You'll also find links for subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher and so on. If you're listening on Apple, don't forget to give Collapse a five-star rating and a review. It helps other listeners find us. Today's episode included audio from Nga Taonga Sound and Vision, TVNZ, MediaWorks and the Ministry of Justice. Thanks also to The Age and Nine. This podcast was made possible with help from New Zealand On Air. Collapse.